Hello guys and dolls, welcome back to Honey Badger 3D Print and Paint. Today we're at Formnext in Germany. We're taking a look at some of the latest and greatest tech in 3D printing. We're talking with some new partners, some old partners, and we're going to chop this up into lots of different videos so that we can try to cover as much as humanly possible. But first of all, let's play a game of jacket, no jacket, because sometimes I'm going to be hot and sometimes I'm not. And it's going to make it really difficult from an editing perspective. <laughs> Let's get in there. Hello guys and dolls, welcome back. We are at Volumic. So we are talking all things EXO series, which is one of the greenest machines at the show. I think we can agree with that. And I'm here with Stefan, and uh, we need to have a conversation about who you are, what your company is. Tell us about it. Yeah, that's a pleasure to receive you because our brand is not so famous in the rest of the world, but in France, we are the French pioneers in 3D printing. Right. 10 years ago, we were the first brand proposing professional machines, desktop machine, FDM, for the market. So we had a lot of new customers which were discovering 3D printing and uh, additive manufacturing and they really trust us in France. So we are working with a lot of big industries, big groups, uh, more than 2,000 sites in France and uh, factories are equipped with our machines. And we are really proud to present in Formnext this year our last machine which has a big size, yeah, 42 centimeters. Right. That's a big difference uh, between a lot of machines today. We propose a, a really a comfortable size of printing with high speed, more than 80 different materials, yeah, and also an incredible uh, accuracy and finishing on the on the materials without post processing. So. That's uh, a real difference between the lots of machines which are presenting a large scale yeah. printing. So there's a short list of printers that go above about 300, about 300, uh, cent, 300 millimeters yeah. uh, in build volume. And the main reason for that is that once you go bigger, everything yeah. gets heavier, everything yeah. starts to get more complicated yeah. and you start having to have, you've got a lot of motion issues with going quickly. Yeah. This guy is moving at a pretty fair pace and you're doing 235. So this is PET G in here at the moment. Yeah. So printing PET G at that kind of speed. Pretty, I mean, pretty impressive for, for, for doing it, you know, in the show in the not, in the, in not yeah. ideal conditions. Um, so talk to me a bit about some of the materials that you can do with this. Yeah, uh, we are really focused on the largest range of materials, but right. we segmented the, all the materials. The first are biosourced and recycled materials because yep. there was a, a kind of enormous request for those new materials. Yep. PTG will be recyclable, but our clients are asking for already recycled PETG. Yeah. That's a main trend. So we are proposing a lot of different materials with recycled and biosource uh, materials. After, there is a, um, always flexible materials, yep. like TPU. Um, that's a main trend. Actually, so what shore hardness is this? Is this this, this nice one in 93. 93, yeah. okay. Yeah, uh, enough. I will bring you something really... Really flexible. flexible. <laughs> no, not, not at all. So TPU will... is, 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 is complicated for a lot of reasons, right? When you melt very flexible elastopolymers, um, you have to control your melt zone very specifically because you're trying to push a marshmallow into a hula hoop. Like it's, it's very, very difficult. You have to have very, very short throw direct drive so that you can put material through and you can create the back pressure to mean that it comes out of the nozzle rather than trying to go out of literally everywhere else. 95 hardness is, or 93 hardness is kind of about the limit of a lot of FDM machines, but you've got yeah. something that is... This one is the same. Yep. But so, but fully flexible. flexible. Yep. The interest is this one could be printed as fast as PLA. As fast as PLA yeah. to yeah. do TPU? Yeah. So I want to be clear, 
and, and it may not come out that well on the video, um, but this is flawless. There is no blobbing, there is no stringing, there is no post-processing. No, no. This is it. directly off the printer, and this yeah. is as good as any ABS PLA print that I've seen. Um, and it is completely, completely malleable, completely flexible. So to do that with TPU, you've got a little bit of special sauce inside of the um, hot end to make that work. What do you think of that? <laughs> because this Jordan is made with TPU. With TPU? Yeah. But a really hard TPU. Right. Yeah. So you can print it faster than PLA. Yeah. But this is still TPU and you won't be able to break it. Right. So that's another way to create some strong object is to use hard TPU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously we've got a lot of different materials. As I said before, there's, there's a short list of machines that go above 300 millimeters in a build volume because of the complications in kinematics and in your motion system. So let's talk a little bit about the motion system. So you've got so th th this is traditional Core XY, but it's a fixed bed at the bottom uh, with, with four Z motors, one on each of the yeah, pillars. So yeah. you're, you're sort of doing, so you're doing active gantry leveling yeah. rather than, so something that really frustrates me when we talk about bed leveling is 90% of bed leveling has absolutely nothing to do with leveling the beds. If you have a probe that goes around and probes all of your individual points, it then creates a software mesh and you are creating a software solution for a hardware problem. So when you're dealing with core XYs where the bed goes down and it probes, if it doesn't have three, at least three independent motors to mean that it can tilt adjust the bed, you aren't leveling your beds at all. All you're doing is creating a software solution for the fact that your bed is unlevel. When you have a four-way gantry system like this, you can independently control each motor, meaning you can actually adjust and tram your, um, your tool head to the geometry of your build plate yeah. and still create a software mesh so that you can make sure that you are getting perfect prints across the board. So what kind of speeds are we printing in, in PLA when we're, when, we're doing, when we're using this machine? We can be a, around 250 millimeters per second, 300. With no loss in quality? No lossing, especially with some specific PLA, yep. even PETG. Yep. So that's fast, that's reliable, yeah. Yeah. and they are focused for industrial. So yes. they, are not, they don't want to print Pokemons. They yeah. want to print some real object, technical object. For yeah. this one, it will be carbon, yeah. so it will be lower in speed but you can have something really incredible and technically really strong. Another point is the bed is not moving, like you said. Yep. So the calibration, you really never use a calibration because yeah. it don't move, Yeah. even on Z. So uh, yeah. th that's another great point. Commercial space has different priorities to consumer space, right? So consumer space kind of wants things quickly, but they're, they're, they're okay with a little bit of tinkering. When it comes to commercial space, it's reliability and repeatability. It's making sure your machine continues to work so that your return on investment isn't, isn't hampered by extra costs of having to replace things, but then as well that you can put it on and you can click and walk away. So there, again, aren't many machines where you can just put on a print and you already know when you click print that it's going to do the thing that it's supposed to do. So slicer-wise, are you using your own slicer? Are you using open source stuff? What, what are you using to, to, to get it going? We are working and proposing free slicers. We are proposing Simplify 3D. Yep. We are proposing also Cura, of yep. course. And now also with Prusa Slicer. Okay. Because Prusa Slicer at the moment is one of the best slicer on the market. Yes, yeah, agreed, yeah. So again, an important part when it comes to commercial is that commercial invariably comes with some sort of enterprise license or a service contract or ongoing costs that you have to build in that year on year you have to pay for a new license with a proprietary piece of software 
that a hardware company then has to pretend they can modify software, which they can't, yeah. and it's awful, and, and I hate everybody who does it, and please stop. Yeah. Specifically, Creality, you know that you do it all the time. Stop doing it, you're bad at software. Yeah. So <laughs> when we're Absolutely. dealing with Prusa Slicer and Cura, and we're also dealing with Simplify, Simplify is Proware, yeah. so it obviously, it's obviously paid for, but Cura and Prusa both have very similar features. They are both open source, and they are both free to use. Yeah. So you don't have to build that yeah, into your commercial And we have model. to take in consideration that people are using sometimes a big farm with a lot of different printers. Yes. And if they can use the same slicer for all the machines, yeah. that's really great but because they will earn time. Streamlines time their is work money. Right. Yep. So it will work. And we really want like Prusa to be really open. Even if it's a professional and industrial machine, we have to be open and all our machine could be customized. Yeah. They could be totally black with carbon. The head could be changed to have, for example, the need to print some lower shores in uh, TPU. Yeah. It's possible with a different head. The same for carbon, fiberglass, or other filaments. So we are open. The firmware also, we are always working on the firmware to open it to add new possibilities. Yep. Everything is fully, uh, can be managed on the screen. You can change speed, change the flow, change uh, temperature, everything during the print to make experimentation, yep. research, and to go for, forward on new materials. So how customizable is this from a, from a sort of a commercial perspective? Can I get higher temperature hot ends or active chamber heaters? Or if I, if I have a specific need yeah. from a commercial standpoint, are you able to modify and change things yeah. to do that? Yeah, these are some special requests for some customers. Yep. Uh, they also ask us for specific sizes. Yeah. So we can do, do uh, those uh, customization. We are not always selling them on our website, yep. but that's totally possible. That's the, the concept. That's our concept. Yeah. And another concept is to have some machines. Maybe some machines are used since five years. Yeah. They are upgradable. Yeah. Uh, an old customer could ask us, yeah, I want to upgrade with a new head. I see that the new machines are faster. Okay, we take the machine, the original machine, and we will upgrade it. Yeah. So they want they are the opposite of some machine which yeah. are much cheaper. And you say hey, when you have a problem, you will throw the machine. It's the inverse. You have an old machine. Yeah. You can have a new machine with the same base and all the new options. So this is. Uh, Something really important for us because we are talking about with professional, yeah. industrial, and they, when they believe in a, in a brand, in a machine, they are okay to upgrade this machine. So as well, so I, I'm sure we're going to get a couple of comments about the fact that you're seeing a commercial machine that has 3D printed parts in it. And I want to be really clear that there are cheap companies that do it um, and they normally injection mold their parts or whatever and then there are professional companies that do it and really what it's showing is that you have complete faith in mm. your parts because you use yeah. them in your yeah. printers it's a very similar point that a lot of people make about Prusa's it's that it's not that Prusa's are, have printed parts and are therefore cheap it's yeah. that Prusa's are so reliable at a mass manufacturing That's... level that you are able to produce parts that you then use yourself to make more printers yeah so seeing those parts and seeing how incredibly chunky they are <laughs> yeah um, is is really nice to see because it means that you have got something that is being used that you yeah. are using at a production level yeah. to make more printers moving forwards and since 10 years at the beginning, people were saying, hey, there is printed parts that's yeah. not realable. And today, that's the opposite. Yeah. They love to have green parts, but we can it do the like same. seems like such a strange attitude to have, though, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. It's the idea of saying, oh, the parts that are in your printer can't be reliable yeah. because they're 3D printed. And they're like, but you're buying a yeah. 3D printer to yeah. make parts. Yeah. So does that mean that you think the parts you make won't be yeah. reliable? Because they will be. Yeah. 
And it's about that idea that 3D printed parts aren't just about producing things cheaply, they're about producing things quickly, reliably, repeatably, and being able to build those into your production line. This isn't just about printing tiny models and figurines and everything else, which admittedly is a lot of what we do. It's also about these being production ready machines yeah. that can be a valuable part of, of, a, of a manufacturing workflow. Brilliant, Bob. Thanks very much for making the time. Yeah. We'll catch you on the next booth.